Welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this Sunday morning. It turns out to be Valentine's Day, which here is Fudge Day. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Um, we'll be mostly talking about God's love today, though. I, I think if we just focus on human love, that's a problem for some people. If they haven't had a you know, great relationship in their lives, maybe it's hard for them to see how God is so kind and loving. But if we focus on God's love as revealed in Christ, maybe we can see the potential for our human love on a more faithful, unconditional level. We invite you to sign the friendship pad as it comes down the road. This is indeed a warm and welcoming church. As I heard from all the inquirers gathered this morning, that they all said they were greeted here, and that's something we like to do, and that helps us spot who our visitors are. And uh, so we can greet you personally either before or after the service. So if you would sign the friendship pad as it comes down the row. And you can also learn the names of the people uh, sitting next to you. If you'd like to learn more about First Presbyterian, we have a, an inquirer's thing, sort of a get acquainted thing in the parlor. The next cycle of three Sundays will begin on March the 14th. So that. It's a very uh, low-key thing, but it's a good way to get acquainted with us and decide if this is where you might like to grow in faith. Young people and children are very much a, a part of this church and our outreach efforts, and that's on display today in the, uh, the Rock Stars Fudge Sale. Rock Stars are the fourth and fifth graders. Rock is uh, reaching out in Christian kindness, and they've been working on this fudge, and it's a mission project. The proceeds benefit Heifer International, uh, you know, cows to end world hunger and poverty around the world. And 100% of the sales and your donations will go to this project, and they're uh, nearing $1,000. But there's still fudge left. If you had ordered some, it was delivered in your Sunday school class. If you haven't ordered some, they'll be down at Memorial Hall after church. So get your fudge in $10 and $5 boxes from the rock stars, our youngest missionaries. Good Eaton with the Adult Fellowship. A uh, week from Thursday on the 25th, we'll leave here at 915, going to the Strickland Dale Restaurant in Snow Hill. Glen Rose and Emmeline and Ketching uh, know where all the good restaurants are. So it's $5 to get on the bus and then whatever you do for lunch that day. It's a good uh, day trip. And I have one uh, news item for today. Uh, we got word this week that Carl Young was selected as the outstanding educator at the College of Education at NC State University. It's obvious that they have their priorities straight. The emphasis is on education, not athletics. Congratulations, Carl. And we're glad you're here to worship with us together on this Lord's Day. Would you join in our call to worship? 
With joyful notes and awakening hearts, let us praise Jesus Christ. May it be our eternal song throughout our whole lives long that Jesus Christ be praised. Let us lift our voices in praise and worship God together. You may be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us ask God to forgive us as we pray together the prayer of confession. Loving God, you have revealed yourself to your people in countless ways, and yet we still don't see clearly. Perhaps that much love and goodness is beyond our experience and doesn't seem real. Or perhaps we have our head in the clouds and simply weren't awake when you spoke. Lord, Give us eyes to see and ears to hear your presence among us. And then, having seen, may we have the strength and courage to hear Jesus' two words, follow me. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. 
The past is finished and gone. Everything becomes fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. I'd like to mention several of the pastoral concerns. Um, the daughter of choir member Rex Kamen and Martha Kamen gave birth to her first child on Thursday at Rex. A daughter, Kayla Abigail. Um, she was born a, m a month early, but is doing very well. And we're thankful for that. Um, we want to continue to keep um, Lisa Hamm and Betty Jordan and others in our thoughts and prayers. Um, Helen Smith is at Cary Rehab. And Casey Crawley was discharged. Um, many of you know that she's been undergoing cancer treatments and she has had pneumonia. So as we turn to God in prayer, let us remember these people. Holy God, with praise and thanksgiving, we come before you, rejoicing in your goodness and your mercy to us. Your gifts of love fill our hearts to overflowing and our world with beauty. We thank you. We thank you for friends and family in this community of faith, for comfortable homes and meaningful work and times of recreation. We thank you for the gifts of winter and the promise of spring. Holy God, we feel your presence with us in all of life, guiding us, encouraging us, comforting us, and strengthening us. In these times of winter silence and days of darkness and shadows, May we look within ourselves and be challenged to growth and new life. As the daffodils bloom in the snow and the pale green buds appear on barren branches, may we remember the promises of Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and our minds to Christ's redeeming grace and the promise of eternal life. God of comfort, we pray your blessing on all those with special needs this day. Those who are ill or fighting serious illness, facing surgery or medical treatments. We pray for those who are suffering or in pain of any kind. The pain of illness, the pain of loss, the pain of brokenness. Be especially with those who have lost loved ones or to whom death draws near. 
Be with those who are discouraged or overwhelmed by anxiety or stress and who need your strength and courage to face the challenges life brings. Caring God, your touch brings comfort, your word brings hope. You know the needs of each of us this day, those fears and wounds and longings in the hidden places of our hearts. Bring healing and peace to your people this day, for it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to invite the children to come forward, please. Good morning. Good morning. are having a pajama party tonight you're right don't forget to wear your pajamas to pathfinders good morning good morning happy valentine's day thank you oh thank you today we celebrate what what valentine's day and what does that mean mm -hmm. Very good. It's a time when we love people we know. We give them candy hearts and love cards. Very good. It's a day where we celebrate love. And even if you're not married or you don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you can still celebrate Valentine's Day. And it is a day where we show each other love. And what I want to talk about is why we share love with one another. It's a very easy answer. We love because God first loved us. We loved each other because God loved us first. Even before we were born, God loved us with all that God is and still loves us every minute of every day. And in thanksgiving and being thankful for all that God has given us and all the love, we love other people. And when we love other people, we show God's love. And we can show that we love God and love Jesus. As uh, Drew so beautifully played this morning, uh, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves us. And to respond to that, we love one another. And people will see in you God's love when you love them and you're kind to them and you help them. Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for your love. Help us to show others how much you love us by loving them. In your name we pray. Amen. You can go to Children's Church or back to your seats.
Let us pray for illumination. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Reading from the Old Testament, Exodus 34, verses 29 through 35. At Mount Sinai, Moses has just completed writing on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Hear now God's word to us. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites, Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out, and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you had come from a Jewish tradition and uh, were gathering in the, among Christians to hear Luke's gospel read in the time of the early church, the end of the first century, you would have been familiar with that story as you heard this story of the transfiguration of Jesus. I'm reading this morning from the New International Version. Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was saying. But while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he's my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, 
and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Did you ever read Bible passages such as this one and ask yourself, what was wrong with these people? There it is right in front of them, and they don't see it. That's him. Did you hear that? That was the voice of God. How could you mistake it for anything else? Did you have your head in the clouds? We have to do the best we can with the smaller epiphanies in our lives. We get hints of God's presence. Sometimes we get pretty clear signs. But who among us has actually heard God's voice or seen literally God's handwriting on the wall? Peter, John, James, what's wrong with you? Why, it won't be long before Peter won't even admit that he knows Jesus. And later on in the, in the New Testament, when these three are preaching, none of them is reported as saying anything at all about this once-in-a-lifetime experience. Jesus glowing so brightly you can't look at him, and the actual voice of God speaking from a cloud. If you were to talk to one of those three, wouldn't the first thing you'd ask, wouldn't it be, what did God say? I heard God spoke nine words. Let me get a stone tablet so I can write these down. What did God say? Do you remember? Or were you zoned out when I, like Peter, James, and John, when I just reread them a moment ago? If God had nine words for us, what would it be? According to the gospel writer Luke, they were, This is my son, the chosen one. Hear him. Biblical commentator and well-respected New Testament scholar Alan Culpepper helps us to see all that Luke packs into these eight verses. The story is set in the part of Luke's gospel where questions have been raised about the identity of Jesus. Just who is this man? So Jesus goes up the mountain to pray, to connect with God. You've probably heard me say after returning from one of my annual trips to the mountains, if there's a reason Jesus went up the mountain to pray, you're closer to God there. I hope you'll have that experience three weeks from today up in Montreat. In Luke's gospel, Jesus always prays at critical times. Another lesson we might take note of. In this scene, two Old Testament figures appear. This seems to be a way of saying that Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament pattern of Moses and Elijah, prophet, lawgiver, revealer of God. And when Peter suggests building three tents, that harkens back to the Festival of Tabernacles celebrated by the Jews each year commemorating the Exodus. The words spoken by God here are echoes of Hebrew scripture. Psalm 2-7 is, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And Isaiah 42 reads, it's one of the servant songs, here is my servant whom, I'm up, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, Culpepper suggests that when the figures of Elijah and Moses disappear from the scene and Jesus is found alone, perhaps that is suggesting that Jesus has superseded the law and the prophets. And the voice of God will say, listen to him. And this whole episode seems very much to be a foreshadowing of Jesus' death and resurrection. The full meaning of this won't be known until then, which is why the disciples don't say anything about this amazing epiphany. Besides, the point is not just knowing who Jesus is, but following him. So Jesus says, hey, don't hang around here and build tents. And the first thing he does when he gets down the mountain is heal a child. Put your faith into action. And the final verse of this section is, and all were astounded at the greatness of God. That's where Jesus focuses our eyes, not on him, but on God. That's who he came to reveal fully to us, just as God was revealed in Moses and Elijah. Now the fullest and complete revelation once and for all. The three disciples could see some of this, but they weren't yet ready to be witnesses to Christ. As Culpepper says, only after the grief of the cross and the joy of the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit 
would they be ready to speak their witness to what God had done in Jesus? Which is one reason we'll observe the season of Lent again, beginning this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. Once again, only after we ponder the crucifixion and the resurrection do we fully comprehend fully who Jesus is and have our eyes opened to the greatness of God. The greatness of God. That can be overwhelming. Like seeing Jesus morph into a brilliant hologram right in front of you, face to face, an epiphany. What's that like? Words fail, of course. You have to, to be there to experience the, the sensory overload, the, the grab in your gut, the fire in your heart, all circuits overloaded in your brain, eyes going blind. Like waking up from a deep sleep and you are in another world of intense light and sound and smell and the earth is shaking. Eugene Peterson tries to translate the transfiguration scene this way in his uh, translation, The Message. Let me reread the passage from Peterson's translation. <clears throat> Jesus climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John, and James along. While he was in prayer, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became blinding white. At once, two men were there talking with him. They turned out to be Moses and Elijah, and what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Peter and those with him were slumped over in sleep. When they came to, rubbing their eyes, they saw Jesus in his glory, and the two men standing with them. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. While he was babbling on like this, a light, radiant cloud enveloped them. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud. This is my son, the Chosen." Listen to him. When the sound of this voice died away, they saw Jesus there alone. They were speechless. And they continued speechless. Said not one thing to anyone during those days of what they had seen. Do you ever have an epiphany? Looking back on my life, I think I've had them consistently, especially at critical times. Thinking about this epiphany in the cloud reminded me of my early days in 1979 driving over to Duke Divinity School to take a course in the afternoon. What we now call I-40 was a deserted road back then. And I kept praying that my Chevy Malibu wouldn't break down because there was only one gas station out there that went over to the airport. It was a lonely road. So perhaps one day, like the disciples, I was, if not asleep, uh, perhaps in some altered state of consciousness, uh, having left my real world job and was heading off to this new world of seminary. And maybe wondering why and for what purpose. And I remember on, on this one day, it was dark and cloudy as I was driving by what we used to call the Burroughs Welcome Building, that novel, a bit of architecture there. And I wasn't even looking over there, but all of a sudden, out of that grayness, the clouds parted and then there were these brilliant rays of sunshine, just like I had never seen before. I took that as a sign from God. You're on the right path. Stay on the path. But the epiphany I'll never forget was in 1996. I had just begun serving a little church in Johnston County, seven miles outside greater metropolitan Selma. Coincidentally, our Dr. Paul Rowland, now a commissioned lay pastor, is preaching this very hour in downtown Selma, at the Selma Presbyterian Church. He may have a dozen souls or so there, not counting Betty, who's playing the piano for him. Looking back, there is no logical explanation of why I stayed at that little church almost four years. It had to be a matter of the heart. My mental image of Sunday mornings is heading out east, listening to WCPE, playing good church music on the radio. When morning gilds the skies would be the perfect song. And I'd be smiling, oh boy, I get to be a minister today. On a good Sunday, we might have 12 or 15 in church there at Fairview, unless it was a high holy day, which at Fairview was Mother's Day. 
we'd have about 100 there command performance. <clears throat> On any given Sunday, Billy and Zelda, Thel and Mildred be sitting over here, Evelyn and Gloria, both Rubies sit on this side, and we'd sing hymns to that piano. I finally got tuned. Folks were usually in very good spirits. But one of those Sundays, after a happy day in church, I was in there tidying up when Thel came back into the church and said word had come from the hospital that Kathy was near death and the family wanted me to be there. Kathy and her husband weren't regular attendees, we'd recruit her to sing at the Christmas cantatas and such. She was a sweet person, probably in her late 40s. I had been to see her just the, the week or so before when she'd had some relatively minor surgery in that same hospital. And for that visit, I had printed up a little Bible verse for her, so a little prayer card. It was from 2 Kings chapter 20, where God replied to Hezekiah's prayer, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Indeed, I will heal you. Was it turned out that little prayer card would be taped above her hospital bed for some time. Something happened after that simple surgical procedure that sent her into ARDS, which stands for Acute or Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Essentially, the, the lungs quit working. She was on a ventilator. I would later learn that the doctor had written on her chart, death is imminent. Well, I'd had a good seminary education. I'd had the life-changing experience of CPE, clinical pastoral education at Wake Med. I'd been with a lot of folks at critical times there in the hospital, but suddenly I felt very small. This family was calling me their pastor to the hospital. What was I supposed to do? And it sounded real, real serious. Would she even be alive when I got there? Well, I headed immediately down Highway 42, the 25 minutes over to the Wilson Hospital. Again, it was a dark, rainy day. Again, clouds up in the sky. And I must have been praying hard that God would help me be some kind of healing presence for her family. And about halfway down the road, I got another one of those cloud epiphanies. On that dark, rainy day, suddenly a couple of those clouds parted just for a few seconds. Sunbeams just roared down from that cloud and I felt this palpable reassurance that God was with me and Kathy would be all right. I realize this doesn't translate well into words, it may sound like a fantasy, but it was very, very real. And indeed I got there met with Kathy and her family and she didn't die, but she was by no means out of the woods. Her doctor kept trying everything he could, every little treatment uh, that might work. He kept tweaking that ventilator to try to get her lungs to respond. But two more times in the next month or so, the doctors would write on her chart, death is imminent. Well, Kathy's still with us today. After her recovery, she went back and compiled from her notes and uh, that she made in her wakeful times and her family and some photos and stuff, tried to put the story back together. And what she thinks happened, the, the miracle moment, was on a Sunday afternoon. At regular times, the patient had to be taken off that ventilator so they could change the, the tubing and stuff out to you know, put clean stuff on there. And during those few moments, the patient is ventilated by hand, you know, the old-fashioned way, with a squeeze thing, bulb, ven bulb ventilator. Well, two nurses who were off that day had, had come by the hospital just to see Kathy. They had gotten to know her and the month and some that she had been there and uh, just cared so deeply, just really liked her line, just came by to check on her. And so the doctor asked if they would mind, you know, ventilating her while he changed the stuff out on the ventilator. What may have happened is one of those manual squeezes of air may have been too strong and it may have dislodged something that perhaps was some sort of blockage or something. Don't know for sure, but that afternoon was a turning point and her lungs started working. She even survived a subsequent surgery just a year or so later, which is highly risky once you've had ARDS. This time she went to Bowman Gray and came through with flying colors. Of course, I should have known that because my head is in the clouds. Little epiphanies, small signs of God's presence. I had seen bunches of those long before I got to Fairview Presbyterian. I remember stopping on the steps of the building at the radio station on the, moment, on the mornings before I went in there and the sun's just starting to come up over the east, eastern, uh, you know, Raleigh was to the east. And I said a little prayer that God would help me be of help to whoever might be listening that day, that I could help people. When the studios moved to the high rise at North Hills from our 
east-facing sixth-floor window, we could see the sunrise come up magnificently. I always thought of just a little bit of vanity that newsman Mike Toscano took it upon himself to rate the sunrises. Yeah, Bob, about the sunrise this morning, I was an eight. Oh, God will be so pleased. I probably was in prayer some mornings when I answered the phone there in the studio. You never knew who was going to call or uh, what was on their mind. Sometimes it was something really serious. And, you know, I was their friend. Or they were going through some life thing. Could I play this song as such a comfort to them or something like that? I remember getting Christmas and birthday cards from this girl who lived up in Littleton. She had some kind of learning disability, but she could write legibly enough. And she always sent birthday and Christmas cards to Bill Leslie and me. And oh, that continued up until just a couple years ago. Bill and I always wrote back, writing Miss Betsy. You don't have to be a professional prophet to get an epiphany. We had opportunities in those days to serve God and to see God's presence among the people we were trying to serve, even in the midst of that crass, competitive world of commercial radio. Now, I didn't have much hospital experience in those days, so I was really torn what to do when... Charlie Murray, who at the time was the manager of the State Farmer's Market, was hospitalized with a real severe intestinal uh, thing. Uh, I really didn't know Charlie. I didn't see him much face to face, but I would talk to him about three days a week on the phone and, you know, call him up at the Farmer's Market. Yeah, morning, Bob. It's a beautiful day at the Farmer's Market. Should I visit him in the hospital? What if he didn't want visitors? What if I made him feel worse? But for whatever reason, I decided to bite the bullet and go see him into that strange hospital with strange hospital smells and sounds and sights. When I finally found his room, I could tell he was in some discomfort, but we had a nice visit and it seemed to cheer him up a little. And in fact, just a few weeks later when he was back at work, he was effusive in his thanks for me coming to visit him. He said, Bob, thank you so much for coming to see me in the hospital. And I want you to know, I felt better the minute you left. <laughs> so maybe I have a gift. <laughs> Actually, I do hope I am some sort of healing presence when I go to visit folks in the hospital or elsewhere. I surely feel as if I'm doing the Lord's work. And many of us have had shared experiences in the hospital. Many of you have known that God has been with us in many a moment through many dangers, toils, and snares. To walk in faith is to be a healing presence for each other. That's what Jesus modeled in this pivotal story in the Gospel of Luke, at this momentous revelation, transfiguration, this epiphany. The very next thing is healing. And the purpose of that healing was to reveal the greatness of God. And if we want to follow Jesus, we're to be about teaching and healing as well. We're to pray without ceasing, not to drift off to sleep while Jesus goes up the mountain to pray. And one of our prayers should be to have the eyes to see what is right before us. If God appears to us, look, listen, pay attention, and listen when God speaks. If God is going to say nine words to us, we better grab hold of each one. This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. And when Jesus speaks his two words, we better listen and be ready to step out. When Jesus says, follow me.
let us say what we believe, saying together the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are found on page 14 in the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and what is ours to give as we receive our morning offering.
us pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for your bountiful blessings to us. May we never take them for granted, treasure them in our hearts, and share them in the world. In your name we pray. Amen. I picked that hymn, not just because it's a fun hymn to sing, but because I think that hymn rep is this church. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. I hear that all the time. People come to the inquirers. They visited all kinds of churches, but they came here and they got a friendly welcome. They met some actual joyful Christians. That could be an epiphany. Well, take that joy out into the world, and may you be an epiphany for others as you serve Christ in your week ahead. Now may the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.